Hi, I'm Brian Coley from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, and today I'll talk to you about pediatric chest ultrasound. In talking about the pediatric chest, we're going to look at several different areas, the pleural spaces, the lungs themselves, the chest wall, mediastinum, and diaphragm. And when you first approach scanning the pediatric chest, remember to be creative with your acoustic windows. There are many ways you can get access into the pediatric chest, from a supraclavicular or suprasternal approach, you can go parasternal or even in young children right through the sternum. Looking at the lung itself, you can go subxiphoid, uh, through the liver subdiaphragmatic and even using the heart itself as an acoustic window. So a lot of people are not used to looking at the chest. Uh, this is not something that radiologists have traditionally done, um, but this is something that our friends in point of care ultrasound and the emergency departments have really uh, embraced and uh, learned a lot from. And so this is a very old quote from Thomas Morgan Roach, who is a pediatrician that wrote the first textbook on pediatric imaging and like anything you have to know what normal looks like before you can figure out what abnormal is. And if you're just getting started I would recommend this paper by Lichtenstein, there are several reviews out there, that talks about the artifacts and normal findings that you can see with lung ultrasound as well as some of the common disease processes. If you look at some of these, you'll also get a sense of the jargon and common terminology that's coming to be used when discussing chest ultrasound findings. So the most common indication for using chest ultrasound right now is to look for the pleural space. And traditionally, we've looked for pleural effusions and things of that sort, but it's also become more common to use it to look for pneumothorax and abnormal air collections. You have to realize in the normal lung, uh, you have normal lung interface of the echogenic pleura and then these multiple reverberations down below it called A-lines. Also in real time you'll see the lung moving back and forth and I'll show you a clip of that in a second. M-mode is actually nicely useful in chest ultrasound. In this case you get what's been referred to as a seashore sign with the static chest wall forming waves coming up against the sandy uh, shore, which is the motion of the lung giving this pattern in this M-mode picture. Now when you have a pneumothorax, you'll get loss of this normal lung sliding and you'll get loss of the normal A-lines. So in M-mode ultrasound, you will have a normal appearing uh, seashore sign and then where this P is indicated, that's sometimes referred to as the lung point sign, beyond which you no longer get the normal sliding, indicative of a pneumothorax. Now my friend Alyssa, who now works in Washington, D.C., gave me this clip from her fellowship. And you can see normal lung sliding here at the upper aspect of the image. And then just below this last rib here, you can see that there's no lung sliding. You lose some of the normal markings indicative of a pneumothorax. Now a lot of us are familiar with using ultrasound. In this kind of case here, we have a child in respiratory distress. They've been intubated. It's a newborn with an umbilical venous catheter. Um, there's clearly an opacified left chest and shift of the mediastinum, but really radiography can't tell us what's going on in that left hemithorax. But with ultrasound, it becomes very, very clear. You've got consolidated lung. You've got a very large pleural effusion with actual eversion to hemidiaphragm. In this case, you can see the spleen below the diaphragm. Now, effusions come in different varieties. A lot of them are very simple, so they're very anechoic. And as you scan through, you can see consolidated lung uh, moving freely within that fluid. Simple effusions may have some debris, some echogenic debris, and you can't tell whether this is going to be uh, empyema or pus in a paranemonic effusion, or if it's going to be hemorrhage as in chest trauma. And as things get more complex, you may start seeing septations develop. But early on, these septations will be thin and wavy, especially in early paranemonic effusions. And as time goes on, these septations may thicken, become more solid and restrictive to the underlying lung and fluid. And then ultimately, you can get a very organized empyema with a solid pleural peel. Like ultrasound elsewhere in the body, um, it is terrific for guiding procedures and making sure they're performed safely and that you are 
accessing the target you want and not hitting anything you don't want to. So in this particular case, with a fairly large, simple effusion and consolidated lung, you can see the thoracentesis needle just coming in, gliding right over the uh, spleen. And here we've aspirated most of the fluid, and you can see the uh, underlying lung becoming re-aerated re and expanding. So in looking at the lung parenchyma itself, we're going to talk about consolidation and when it continues on into abscess. We'll talk a little bit about interstitial disease and, though not quite so common in children, a little bit about masses as well. So in consolidated lung, you can often find these linear branching echogenicities, and these are air bronchograms. And this is the equivalent of the chest radiographic finding of an air bronchogram. And this is just air that you're seeing against a background of consolidated, non-aerated lung. So there's a fair amount written about air bronchograms and trying to make the distinction between static and dynamic air bronchograms. So in these static air bronchograms, that is, the air within the bronchi does not move, it's felt that this represents atelectasis more likely than pneumonia. And hopefully you can appreciate in these couple of clips dynamic air bronchograms where you actually have the little bubbles of air move as you can see uh, as the lung moves. And so what this indicates is that there's going to be air and fluid within the bronchi. And while not a perfect sign, uh, in this situation it's more likely that the air bronchograms in consolidation represents pneumonia and infection rather than just simple atelectasis. Now this is not a foolproof sign, even though some of the literature suggests it has a very high sensitivity and specificity, but it's still something to look out for and something to take into consideration of the rest of the clinical findings. The lung can get very dense, and this has been referred to as hepatization. In this particular image of a consolidated right lower lobe uh, against the diaphragm, you can see that the lung is consolidated with air bronchograms, and it looks similar to the uh, liver that's immediately under underneath with the branching echogenic structures representing portal triads. As consolidation increases or as uh, ischemia may happen in the lung, you can start getting more heterogeneity as you can see in this particular case. And if it goes on with a poor insufficient treatment, you can actually get a necrotizing pneumonia. Here you can see multiple hypoechoic lesions within the consolidated lung. These are probably areas of incipient necrosis. In children, there seems to be tremendous uh, ability to recover from this kind of infection. Um, but sometimes, as in this case, it'll go on to form an actual abscess. Here's actually air within the abscess cavity. And again, if it's up against the pleural space, uh, ultrasound can be a terrific method to guide aspiration and or drainage of these collections. Now something else you may not think ultrasound would be good for, but it's actually to identify um, abnormal air collections within the lung as well. So this is a very sick child who had a pneumatocele of unclear etiology. You can see that there's consolidation of most of the left lung as well as a lot of body wall edema, and they could not get this child off the ventilator. So we were asked to try to drain this in the ICU in the hopes that this would allow re-expansion of the lung and improvement in respiratory status. And so this can be sort of a daunting task if you're not used to it. And when you first put the transducer down, you just see this sort of image, which I think is very hard to interpret as to what's going on in the left chest. But as you gradually move inferiorly where you know this seal is, all of a sudden you see a very specific, very different structure that corresponds to the seal, and that allowed placement of a needle at the patient's bedside and a drainage catheter. And within 48 hours, you can see that there is marked improvement in that chest, body wall edema is down, and the patient has been able to be extubated. Now, a very interesting area in chest ultrasound is the evaluation of interstitial disease. Um, again, in radiology, we're generally used to thinking that uh, air and its interfaces just get in the way, but you can actually get a lot of information from the artifacts that you get from interstitial disease and what it does to the uh, ultrasound beam. So I want to call your attention to these very uh, bright linear stripes emanating from the diaphragm here. These are called lung rockets or beelines. And a clip, again, provided by my friend Alyssa, um, shows you multiple uh, beelines here at the lung surface. Notice how these go all the way to the bottom of the image. They obliterate the A-lines um, and uh, uh, are indicative of interstitial lung disease. 
Now, it's, in kids, it's really hard to say what this disease might be. In adult literature, you can read about B3 and B7 lines, indicating lines that are either 3 millimeters apart or 7 millimeters apart, and people claiming you can discern interstitial fibrosis or emphysema from interstitial disease such as volume overload. And that may happen in children. I just don't think there's enough experience. But there's, it's also uncertain as to whether these measurements really apply in the pediatric chest or at what ages they may or may not apply. So um, I think we'll, we'll stay tuned on that and see what we can get from it. But certainly I think uh, there's enough value that you can diagnose interstitial disease in kids just from the lung rockets alone. So here's a child who's intubated, clearly has both interstitial and uh, alveolar disease. And on ultrasound done for other reasons, you can see some peripheral areas of consolidation here on the transverse image. Um, you can see some discrete lung rockets, but I also want you to look at uh, just the abnormal interface. And these are really confluent B lines. And when you have very severe disease, you just get this abnormal echogenicity. You don't see normal A lines. Um, and this is, again, indicative of very severe interstitial disease. This is the kind of thing you can see in newborns with severe respiratory distress, distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease. And there's some reasonable literature from uh, Europe that suggests you can actually predict outcomes and severity with the basis of lung ultrasound. Just another child who is being scanned for other reasons. Here's the spleen in the left upper quadrant. You can see innumerable um, lung rockets or B lines uh, in the lower part of the image. This is almost confluent. And just the corresponding chest radiograph again confirms um, that there is interstitial disease. So the cases I've shown you before were in kids who we knew they had lung disease. So you might ask yourself, well, this didn't really you know, add anything to the examination showing lung rockets. But here's a child came to the emergency room and had acute renal failure, and we were performing an ultrasound to evaluate the kidneys to try to figure out why. And in this image, you can see uh, the liver, and you can see an abnormally echogenic kidney. There is no hydronephrosis. The child ended up having um, acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. But look at the edge of the image, you can see there are a whole bunch of little lung rockets, and that's not normal. Um, and as we talked to the clinicians, they said, well, the child is a little bit short of breath, and a subsequent chest x-ray shows some severe interstitial lung disease and enlarged cardiac silhouette indicative of volume overload because of the acute renal failure. Another very useful area of chest ultrasound in kids is looking at the chest wall itself. In general, most of the time we're looking at masses, occasionally infections, um, and occasionally looking at fractures. Abnormal rib ends are very common. These are painless bumps that sometimes cause great distress. In this case, here is a normal hypoechoic cartilaginous rib end, and here's a bifid rib, a smaller rib end right there. In children who have painless lumps of their thorax, these are almost never anything serious, and I believe that all of them should be approached with ultrasound first. Here's a case in point. This is a teenage girl who had a small chest bump, had two CTs which failed to diagnose it. Here in retrospect is actually, is actually the abnormal bump. You can see it has a similar uh, density as the underlying muscle, sort of nonspecific soft tissue. There's nothing inflammatory around it. And when finally they came to ultrasound, which of course you can actually palpate and scan the bump itself in this transverse image with the sternum in the center, you can see that it's just abnormal or rather an anomalous little accessory slip of muscle, which is not that uncommon, completely unremarkable and benign. The child did not need the radiation or the expense of two CT scans for this painless lump. So again, they should all be evaluated with ultrasound first. Here's another case of a hemangioma, a pretty uh, common chest wall abnormality. Uh, these are variably echogenic depending on their stage of involution, generally fairly well circumscribed. Um, this particular case was moderately hyperemic. Here's another one, a slightly larger lesion within the intermuscular uh, portions of the chest wall. Again, fairly hyperemic. Um, this child got a CT scan just because of its size, but again, this just shows a typical hemangioma um, with contrast enhancement. These are benign lesions and typically will involute as the child grows older than the age of two or three years. Painful chest wall masses are a little bit different. This is a child who had pain and fever. Um, and as you scan here to get you oriented in this transverse image, 
This is on the bottom right. This is the rib, and it is surrounded by this abnormal fluid collection at real time. Uh, this did demonstrate swirling and mobility. There's hyperemia in the surrounding soft tissues. Um, the child again had pain and fever. There was an aspiration and we got pus. The child went on to an MRI to look for other sites of disease and actually this child had uh, disseminated foci of infection but on the chest wall you can see pockets of fluid with surrounding uh, enhancement on this post contrast T1 weighted images as well as uh, indentation of the liver and this ended up being methicillin resistant Staph aureus. This child, a uh, teenager, came into the emergency department with fever and shortness of breath and was sent to us in interventional radiology to place a chest tube for presumed paranemonic effusion um, and or empyema. We got the patient on the table and the first thing we did is we looked with ultrasound and lo and behold this was not just a simple effusion, it was a very large mass. We changed our approach uh, and did a biopsy followed by a chest tube to drain the pleural effusion. The child did subsequently go and get a CT for staging. You can see this large primitive neurodermal tumor or Askins tumor arising from the uh, rib along the chest wall. And if you go back to the chest x-ray, you can actually see some subtle changes on those plane films. So again, not everything that comes to you as a paranemonic effusion or simple fluid will turn out to be that way. But quite honestly, ultrasound is completely sufficient for diagnosis and initial patient management. It's usually not vital to diagnose a rib fracture. Uh, usually the things of concern are to make sure there's no pneumothorax or underlying um, hemothorax, but it is often to, uh, to uh, comfort patients and reinforce a diagnosis to actually show them that there's a fracture. Um, and in this case, it's very easy to pick up. As you scan over the tender portion of the rib, you'll see a very obvious break in the underlying cortex often a little associated hematoma or subperiosteal collection. And so this can be very valuable as well and is a fairly quick screening tool. Most of the time the mediastinum is evaluated with CT or MR, but I think especially in younger kids, uh, ultrasound is often a very reasonable first line choice. So in this child who has an abnormal contour of the superior right mediastinum, uh, we were asked to do a chest CT, but we said, look, can we really do an ultrasound first? I think we can get you the answer. And in this case, we uh, very quickly saw a soft tissue mass right behind the sternum, which is hypoechoic here because it's all cartilage. And this is a very typical appearance of a thymus. It sort of has a, a dot dash appearance. Um, it is soft and conforms to the chest wall. And very quickly and uh, very easily, without any radiation, without any sedation, you can assure everybody, uh, clinicians and parents alike, that this is a normal finding, just a slightly anomalous looking thymus. Similarly, this child on this frontal radiograph has what appears to be an enlarged cardiac silhouette. But if you come and do the uh, ultrasound examination again, you can see this fairly large thymus, which is just a normal variant with this typical dot dash pattern. Um, filling the chest and the heart is actually normal size, there is no abnormal mass and again no radiation very quickly you can determine that this is a normal thymus. Another thymus here, okay, it looks like it might be a right upper lobe collapse but again with ultrasound you can see it's a very typical thymic pattern with these little dots and dashes conforming to the anterior chest wall and without any mass effect. This child's clearly had uh, multiple thoracic interventions, has an unusual rounded contour in the right side of the mediastinum. There was some concern, could this represent a pseudoaneurysm from the patient's prior procedures? Again, ultrasound clearly shows the normal dot dash pattern of thymic tissue and that there is nothing to be concerned about. Occasionally children may present with bulging masses at the base of their neck and again real-time ultrasound here can show a thymic tissue herniating up into the chest or I'm sorry into the base of the neck. This is a normal finding and only needs reassurance and uh, no other therapy. And occasionally you can actually find uh, other diseases. So this is a mediastinal teratoma, solid and cystic mass within the thorax. And in this case, with ultrasound on the left and MRI on the right, there's a lymphatic malformation behind the heart that surrounds the aorta and esophagus. 
Another very uh, good use of ultrasound is to evaluate the diaphragm, to look for normal function, to evaluate for hernias or even tracions, and in the acute uh, or ICU setting to look for diaphragmatic paralysis. So in this particular clip, you can see uh, normal and symmetric movement of the hemidiaphragms. You can also see quite a few lung rockets here coming off the base of the right chest. So this is not exactly a mystery diagnosis. This is a diaphragmatic hernia, a little unusual in that it's on the right side. But looking with ultrasound, which is occasionally useful to tell the surgeon what the size of the defect might be, you can see normal diaphragm here with the arrows, a hypochoic muscle, and then where the arrow is, you can see a break and then herniation of abdominal contents into the chest cavity. Even tracians can be evaluated. Occasionally, this is useful to help the surgeons know whether there needs to be a plication um, to see if there's any movement at all or if it's actually a, uh, a hernia. Um, just with a little liver in the chest. And again, at ultrasound, you can clearly see just an eventration or thinning part of the diaphragm with a protrusion of the liver up into the thorax. And on this clip, you can see portions of the diaphragm down below that are working, but an area where the uh, eventration is, where there's no contraction of the diaphragm. And if they go and placate this, the child might have better lung excursion and uh, better exercise tolerance. Here's a child post-op who has uh, a very elevated uh, hemidiaphragm. Uh, given the shape of that, you would be concerned about diaphragmatic paralysis. And it's very easy to go up at the bedside with ultrasound of the patient off the ventilator. You can see normal motion of the left hemidiaphragm and no motion or perhaps even paradoxical motion of the right hemidiaphragm. And again, notice the lung rockets indicative of basilar lung disease. So in sum, uh, chest ultrasound is not a tool that's used with great frequency by radiologists, but uh, has been embraced and really promulgated by emergency and critical care physicians. Uh, and I think it's got great benefit and great utility. In pediatrics, it's still being discovered, um, but already I found a lot of use for it in my practice, and I think it's going to be a real game changer for a lot of people. Be creative with the acoustic windows. The pediatric chest has a lot more ways to get in uh, to the thorax because of uh, uh, unossified cartilages, because of thymus, uh, because of the smaller size. You can even go parasternal from behind. It provides unique information, information you can't get from other sources, and it can often obviate the need for CT in many cases. So I recommend giving it a try. I think you'll find it useful in your practice. Thanks for your time.